live in a supernatural world populated with supernatural beings. And over the weeks, we've kind of laid out a framework for the way that works. We've talked about different classifications of supernatural beings. We talked about Satan and where evil came from. We talked about demons and evil spirits and what their work is. And tonight, we're going to shift our focus to angels, or as our brothers in the South like to call them, angels. Angels. And tonight, the title of the message tonight is Another in the Fire. Another in the Fire. I'm not going to lie, I totally ripped that from a Hillsong United song. Yeah. Um, but it kind of fits what we're talking about. We are recording, right? Yep. Thanks, boys. So, this series hopefully is a reminder to you guys that we do not live a boring life. I don't care what you guys have heard. Being a Christian is not a boring life, at least if you're serious about your faith. I hope you guys are. So, our life is designed not just to take in the things that we can't see, but also the things that we uh, can't see. I think I said can't twice. But God has, has equipped us with a supernatural power, with His Holy Spirit, so that we can pray prayers and see miracles happen. It's exciting. So, despite what you guys may have seen on TV, maybe in movies, cartoons, read in books, angels are not fat little babies with bow and arrows and flowing golden locks who shoot, you know, a, a bow and arrow that has hearts that go through people's butt. Maybe that's Cupid. Aww. Listen, the angels that we read about in the Bible are big, strong warriors whose presence often terrified the people who saw them. They're real, they're powerful. And if you're a believer, they're a vital part of your life. So throughout the Bible, we have angelic beings popping up all over the place. We have people interacting with them. So what does this tell us? It tells us that God intends for it to be this way. This is the norm. You and I, we live a supernatural life. I don't care what you guys have been told. We live a supernatural life in angels interact with you and I in a lot more ways than you may have expected. So I'm just going to share two quick stories with you guys. So a friend of mine from college told me about an experience uh, where his grandmother had, was, was home alone once uh, in the middle of the day, and someone knocked on her door, and when she went to answer it, she was greeted by a man with a knife who was ready to kill her and, and rob her house. But when he saw her, his face turned pale and he ran away. Well, he was later caught by police, and they questioned him why he ran, and his response was, when the door opened, I saw two large and strong men standing behind her. And to this day, my friend swears that it must have been two angels that were sent to protect her because there was no one at his grandma's house. Another one, um, this, is, this is what, uh, I, I don't actually know this person, but I thought this is a really interesting story. Um, he, said, he said, my experience with, with angels happened this way. I was traveling west on a divided four-lane highway. There were openings for turns about every quarter mile, and it was 6.30 in the morning and raining. A woman T-boned me on the back driver's side fender. My car spun and flipped multiple times and came to a rest in the median. Out of nowhere, a guy shows up to my driver's side window. He has a large cowboy hat on. Get you up. He says, you are going to be okay. And he holds my hand. I asked him his name, and he looks away as if he didn't want to tell me. And he says, Bill Hill. I smiled and said, thank you. Another motorist who stopped calls 911 and an ambulance is dispatched. When they arrive, he moves out of the way for the EMTs to get me out of the car. Uh, I get checked out and I get, uh, I get to go home with broken ribs and a shattered kneecap. A few days later, my mom takes me to see the car. What a wreck. I told her to help get some personal items from the car. When I looked in the back seat, there's the dude's cowboy hat. I told my mom about him, and we both proceeded to try and find him to thank him for being so kind. Turns out he never existed. We live in a super small town of only a thousand people. We checked with the local police stations and churches everywhere. No one knew a Bill Hill. How did his hat get in my back seat? He wore it the whole time. He held my hand, and the hat was on, or and, and had the hat on when he got out of the way for the EMTs. I think he was an angel. Why would I have his hat? You guys know any cowboys? They don't, they're very protective of their hats. So I thought those were just two interesting stories that I'd share with you guys. 
Now tonight you guys are probably going to be reminded some things about angels, but you're probably going to learn a lot of new things. And when we learn about the awesomeness and we learn about the power of angels, it can possibly be tempting to, to worship angels or to pray to angels or to have admiration toward angels. And you guys probably know of uh, some Christians who maybe do that. But this is something that Scripture warns against. All right, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. He says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head. So we got to be careful. we got to be cautious. When, if you ever hear someone who's talking to you and they're talking to you about all their angelic experiences, all the times that they've seen an angel, or all the times that they've seen demons, or this or that, and they're, they're almost like bragging about it, trying to sound better. Paul's saying, like, oh, no, like, time out. Don't believe it. Don't listen to them. They've lost their connection with Jesus. It's a pretty bold statement. All right? So on the one hand, where we need to know about angels and it's important for us to understand the supernatural world, we also need to understand that there's many things that we need to know about and we need to focus on the main things. So angels, then, are not the main thing. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 says that angels are ministering spirits. Actually, I don't have that one on the screen. Angels are ministering spirits who are called to help those who are called to inherit salvation. So at the same time, angels are very active. They're active in heaven and they're active in our lives. And it, it's uh, important for us to know what the Bible says about them. Because the Bible says a lot about them. I'm going to list off some things that you guys need to know about angels. First, angels worship God. Angels worship God. Maybe this one's kind of obvious. But we see in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. We get that up on the screen. It says, Then I looked again and I heard... The voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne of the living beings and the elders. So this is, uh, this is like a, a vision um, of, of what it looks like in heaven. And this one's kind of crazy. It continues on in verse 6. It says, In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. Maybe you're like, well, what do you mean they have eyes all over their whole body? I don't know. They got eyes all over their whole body. I, I, I don't know what that means. What are they for? Well, what are your eyes for? For seeing, right? you got to remember, these, these beings that he's talking about are called cherubim, which are throne guardians, meaning that nothing and no one approaches the throne of God without their notice. They see more than your mom. You know, your moms have eyes in the back of their heads. These guys got eyes everywhere. All right? And then it says, day after day, and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Do they ever get tired of this? Maybe you're sitting there like, forever and ever? They're worshiping God? No, they don't get tired of this because they know God in all of his glory. They are so in awe of who God is, of what he does, of what he continues to do, that they never stop crying out, and worship to Him. You know, and that says something about us. You know, I think that that says something about the lack of our understanding about the greatness of God, that we would question whether or not a being could simply worship God for eternity. It continues on, to, and I'm going to read this really quick. Uh, chapter 4, verse 9 and 11 of Revelation. It says, whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and they exist because you created what you please. So I want you guys to think about this. Anytime that we're worshiping God, anytime that we're praising God, anytime, you know, like before or after uh, I come up here and I talk, when we worship... We're joining in with millions and millions of angels. Yeah. How cool is that? I mean, an innumerable, innumerable the number of angels are worshiping God and we're joining in with them. Number two, angels are warriors. Angels are warriors. I don't care what you guys have been raised to believe. I'm going to tell you guys what the Bible says about them. 
First scripture that I got is Psalm 103. It says, praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. So why do you need armies? Why would you need an army? You're fighting a war, right? You know, what does it look like when they fight, maybe you're asking? Well, scripture isn't 100% clear, but we do get... Um, a couple pictures of what it may look like. I mean, we know that Jacob wrestled with an angel, right? He says that he wrestled me. He's like, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And we get some sense that at least some of the combat that angels um, get into is hand to hand. You know, we hear in the Bible about them using swords and weapons. It's kind of crazy, right? We also see in, in Revelation chapter 12, it says, Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And his angels, the dragon talking about Satan. And Michael is one of the two archangels in the Bible. So he's fighting against Satan here. And then we also see in Daniel chapter 12, it says, At that time, Michael the archangel who stands guard over your nation will arise. So Michael here is guarding the entire nation of Israel. Angels are warriors. You know, and I could spend a lot more time talking about this, but we got to move on. But I would suggest that not only are angels involved in spiritual battles and spiritual wars and wars that we can that we can't see but they're also involved in wars that we can see there's actually quite a few examples of this in scripture so in judges 5:20 this is actually really cool it says from heaven the stars fought from their courses they fought against Sisera so in this story Deborah is talking or she's actually singing after they had won a battle against Sisera. And I'm not going to show you guys the whole story so we can keep on moving. But if you remember from our, from the first message, when, especially in the Old Testament, when it says the stars, that phrase, the stars, that usually is, is, used to, is a term used to describe angels. And the story talks about the commander of the enemy army and about how he had 800 iron chariots. Now an iron chariot in that day was like a battle tank. All right? He had 800 of these and what's crazy is if you read the story, it says that he, that he got off of his chariot and he ran on foot. Now, what would be faster? Running on foot or being in a chariot pulled by a horse? Probably in a chariot, right? Well, a lot of theologians, and what a theologian is, is someone who spends their whole life studying the Bible. A lot of theologians believe that angels destroyed the chariots. And maybe you're like, what? That is a, what? Where are you getting that from? Well, it happened again, uh, if you guys remember the story of the Egyptians, or the uh, Israelites es escaping from the Egyptians, it says that when the Egyptians were chasing him, it says that the wheels came off and broke off of the chariots. Angels fighting for Israel. It's crazy. Angel warriors. I'm going to move on. I can talk about that for a long time. Number three, angels protect us. Angels protect us. This one's comforting. It says in Psalms 91, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. So, remember that, that scene in heaven where it says that there's millions and millions of angels surrounding God that are all attending to him. That's because God's saying, hey, I, I see Cole. Cole's praying to me right now. He's sitting he needs my help. Hey, you go help him. Or he's like, hey, Reese. Reese is needing help. Yeah, he, he's struggling in school. He's praying to me. Hey, you, go help him. He sees you. So angels protect us. Angels protect us. Uh, David writes, angels surround and protect those who fear God. You know, when I, when I bought my home um, a year and a half ago, I remember I went around my house and I prayed for it. I, I prayed that God would send his angels to protect uh, my house and protect everyone who went inside of it. You know, and my mom, looking back to my childhood, my mom prayed over me every single morning and every single night um, when I woke up before I went to school and she prayed for me um, before I went to bed. You know, and I never really got hurt or sick growing up. Like, I could probably count on one hand the amount of times that I ever got, like, really sick, you know, besides, like, a little cold. I never really got sick, and, um, and I don't know, and I, the only time I've ever gotten, like, a somewhat serious injury, I, like, fractured my kneecap, which, if you guys know me, I'm a risk taker, right? I like to live like Larry. I live on the edge. I'm always doing stupid stuff, and I, like, never got sick. I never got hurt, and, you know, and I'm not saying that my mom praying that Praying for that is the reason, but I mean, hey, might be. I remember she would always say, 
God sent your guardian angels to protect Peyton while he's at school. She would say that every single day that I was growing up. One more crazy story. I don't know if you guys have heard this, but uh, so in this in this story, I'm just going to summarize it. So Elisha and the Israelites are getting ready to fight this Syrian army. Okay, and uh, we'll pick up in verse verse 15. So Elisha's servant. It says, when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than there are on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. That's pretty crazy. I, like, just picture that. Picture you're getting ready to go into battle, and you're you're outnumbered like by an immense margin. Like there's way more of the enemy than there is of you. And then your leader, your general, says, God, open up his eyes, and you open up your eyes, and there's angels riding chariots of fire surrounding the enemy army. I mean that's that's some goosebumps here. Lord of the Rings ain't got nothing on that. Billy Graham, Billy Graham is the most famous um, evangelist of the 20th century. He said, if our eyes could be opened and we could see, we would see the heavenlies ablaze with angels and demons locked in warfare. Number four, angels observe us. Angels observe us. For what purpose? You're like, why are angels watching us? Well, the Bible says that angels form opinions of us. Maybe that's kind of scary. Angels form opinions of us. We see in Daniel, an angel talks to Daniel in chapter 10, and he says, hey, he said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, that's an angel. Imagine if an angel went up to you and he's like, hey, they talk pretty highly of you in heaven. Like, you're kind of a big deal. You see those numbers, you're, you're giving the speed of light. We see all the people you're telling about Jesus. This angel's like, Daniel, we've we heard about you in heaven. We see that you pray three times a day. We know that you're faithful. We see you. We know that you honor God. Daniel, we honor you. That's pretty dope. I'm not going to lie. But at the same time, angels also observe wicked people. And it says that they carry out God's divine judgment. So I'll show you guys three scriptures that talks about them watching. Just really quick. They're all at once. All in Daniel. It says, And behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, and because the king saw a watcher. So angels are watching you, like Santa Claus. You know the story? Better not come, better not cry. You know, like Santa Claus is watching you. How many guys believe, oh wait. Okay, well, I'm just going to say it. How many guys b believed that when you were a kid, I mean, maybe this is just me, but my, gram my grandmas and my mom would always be like, there's elves that are watching you. Like they're like they're out they're outside and they're watching you and, and my grandma would totally would make it up. They'd be like, oh I was like I see an elf in the backyard, like you better be good. I believed it. Alright? Elves weren't watching me. I would got a little paranoid. <laughs> I remember I would like do something that was bad and then I'd like I'd like look out the window and say, Did they see? Did they see? But anyways, angels watch you. So whatever. Um, number five. Angels give us directions from God. Angels are our Siri. So, what we see in Acts, what we see in the book of Acts is, um, or uh, patterns that we see in Acts are things that tell us in the modern day church that this is something that should be normal for you. Basically, if you see things repeating in the book of Acts, you shouldn't be surprised if that happens in your life. We see in Acts chapter 5, Verse 19, it says, But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Then he told them, Go to the temple and give the people this message of life. And we see it again a couple chapters later. It says, As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, now think about this. Does the Holy Spirit speak to people in the book of Acts? Yes. He does. Does Jesus speak to people in Acts? Yes, that's okay. Jesus does. Do angels speak to people in the book of Acts? Yes. And here's why this is important. I'm going somewhere with this. Because we as Christians can tend to be like 
And I'm talking to myself right now. Well, this is how I hear from God, and blah, 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 blah. you know, it's this little, this little voice inside, and that's the way, that, that's the way that I hear from God. And while that's great for a time, that doesn't mean that it's going to be like that every single time. Whenever people say, I only hear God like this, I only hear God when I'm like this. I, I can only hear God if I, if I play like the worship at this volume, and I turn off all the lights, and I sit there in silence, and and sing Kumbaya. Listen, it's dangerous when you do that because you're putting God in a box and you're going to miss what God's trying to tell you. All right? Because God works in a variety of ways. God can work through His Spirit. God can work through His Word. God can work through angels. God can work through a friend. Sometimes the voice of the Lord shows up. But you guys can't put God in a box and say, I only hear God like this. Number six, angels deliver God's people. I love this one, too. How many of you guys have ever heard of the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Right? Yeah. Daniel, he gets, he gets booted in the lion's den. Then angels show up, close the mouth of the lions. Right? Everyone knows that. Well, I'm going to talk about another one. So Peter, in this, at this point in the Bible, he's in prison. Right? He's in prison. And the point of this is when we pray, God works. And one of the ways that God works is by sending angels. All right? So we see in Acts chapter 12, it's kind of crazy. I want, you guys, I want you guys to picture this. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The church, us, that's us. The church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light at the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. Can you imagine that? You're sleeping in prison. Someone's kicking you. Five more minutes, Mom. No, oh, mm -mm. Or if you're Kirsten, mm -mm. when you wake up, and you open up your eyes and it's a freaking angel kicking you. <laughs> angel struck him on the side. And the chains fell off of his wrists. Then the angel told him, get dressed, oh, so he was naked, and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. Guys, listen, we can pray and ask for things, and sometimes the way that God will answer those prayers is by sending an angel. I know maybe some of you guys are sitting there and you're like, what in the world? I've never seen an angel before. But listen, it's all throughout the Bible, and if it happens repeatedly in the book of Acts especially, it means that it should be normative for us. It means that we should be expecting it. Number seven, this one's pretty cool. This one's pretty dope. Angels take us to heaven when we die. Angels take us to heaven. We see in Luke 16, it says, The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Abraham's side means heaven. And this isn't the only place that we see this. We also see in Matthew 24, it says, And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now this... This is taking place during the Great Tribulation, all right? This is taking place at the end of the world. And this is a rescue operation. This is like a military evacuation. Picture this. Angels and demons battling, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Do you guys really think that demonic beings and evil supernatural beings would, would let you leave this earth and go to heaven without a fight? Honestly, do you guys think that? Think about it. Well, I've got the answer for you, because we see something very similar to this in Jude 9. It says, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, Moses, like, big shot in the Old Testament, like, delivered Israel from the Egyptians. One of the most famous people in the Bible, Michael, the archangel, is arguing with the devil about what to do with his body. Did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So what's going on here is, is God buried Moses, and now there's, there's a dispute. Michael and the devil are arguing about what to do with Moses' body. And the devil's like, like he's a murderer, like he's got anger issues. That talk about, talks about that all the time, uh, about Moses, about his, his anger issues. But they're like, he's not good enough, you can't bring him to heaven. And if the devil and, uh, and his angels do that for Moses, one of the most famous people in the Bible, you better believe that they're going to be doing something like that when you die. Just think about it. I mean, why do you guys think that it says that we're taken to heaven in the twinkling of an eye? When it says that, that the church is raptured and we all go up to heaven, why do you think it says it 
happens in the twinkling of an eye. Why do you think nobody knows the day or the hour? I mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So Michael then rebukes the devil, pulls out his pocket ace. He's like, no, nah, bounce, buddy. Up off. The Lord rebuke you. Then he takes Moses to heaven. Number eight, keeping it moving. Angels are agents of divine judgment. We'll, we'll move through this one quick. Verse 49 in Matthew chapter 13, it says, This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, angels will give you a, a private escort to heaven. You know, with their little wings, however you want to picture them. Take you up to heaven. Or, if you reject Jesus, you reject his free gift, they'll be the ones to throw you in to hell. Number nine, angels bring messages from God. So we see this all throughout scripture, you know. Think about the Christmas story. How many of you guys love Christmas? Listen, I put that question up there. I love Christmas. I started playing Christmas music last Wednesday. Uh, we see this uh, with Gabriel going to Zechariah the priest. And then also, just one, one quick scripture here. In Acts 27, it says, Last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said... Alright, so angels bring messages from God. Number 10, I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come back up here. Angels strengthen us. Angels strengthen us. I mean, we see that an angel... Uh, strengthened Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We also see in Luke 22, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And again in Daniel 10, it says, How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Talking about an angel. So angels can give you uh, physical strength and spiritual strength. Number 11, this is the last point. This one might blow your mind. Angels appear to us without us knowing it. Angels appear to us without us knowing it. You know, I, thinking back on my life, there's been a couple of times where I feel like God's almost like pulled back the curtain to look into the, into the supernatural realm and remind, and I felt like he was reminding me of the realities that are a part of our life. I remember when I was in Thailand especially, spiritual warfare was just like so incredibly heavy there um, people in that culture it's like a, they're pretty much all Buddhists and the Buddhist religion is they like invite spirits they invite demons into their house so it's a it's a really really um, it's a really really tough environment to work in and I remember there was there were certain times where where I, where I would see things that, that I never really saw in you know over here in the United States and remember this one time in particular um, I, I was sleeping in my room, and um, I woke up in the middle of the night, which, if you guys know me, I, I don't wake up in the middle of the night, like, ever. Like, I'm a heavy sleeper. I can fall asleep anywhere. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was instantly, like, wide awake. And I felt this, like, this, this evil presence that was, like, was, like, nothing that I'd ever experienced. And there was, like, no doubt about it. So I woke up. And I remember I like I so I was laying on my stomach and I rolled over onto my back and, and at the foot of my bed there was this like this giant black figure. It was like it was just so like like dark, like black doesn't even do it justice. It's just so dark and you can just like feel the evil. And I sat there and I was like frozen. Now some of you guys are like, why didn't you say in the name of Jesus flee? Well yeah, maybe you guys should have been there to say that for me. But <laughs> I remember I just sat there. And, and I was frozen in fear, and, and I started praying, started praying out loud, and, and it eventually went away. But I, I remember praying and, and thinking about it, looking back on it, and I feel like, like God does that sometimes when he's like, listen, I, I think I shared this last week, but Thailand is such an incredibly hard place for missionaries to go. Listen, there, there's tons and tons of, there's like been hundreds of missionaries that have gone there over the last hundred years, and the Christian population in Thailand hasn't grown at all. And there's so much, it's just like such an incredibly difficult place to do, and I feel like God pulled it back, 
it's almost like a reminder, like, hey, like this is what you're up against. Like, the reason why, why you're dealing with this, the reason why you're having all of these difficulties, the reason why it's hard, is not just the things you see. Listen, there's a battle around you that's taking place. I'm just letting you know what you're up against. We see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? The writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, be nice to people. Show Jesus love to them. Be kind. Because some of you guys have talked to an angel and you didn't even realize it. Listen, now let me just say this to you. Angels can appear to you as an angel, you know, like sometimes in the Bible, where it says that they saw him and they, they fainted. They were just horrified, like, oh my gosh, what is this crazy thing? Or an angel can appear to you and look like a person. You know, we see that all throughout the Bible. And, and I think it's reasonable to assume whenever you're gathered in a large group, especially at a place like camp or momentum or something like that, I think it's reasonable to assume that that place is full of angels. I'm going to tell you guys a quick story. So I went to this church called James River when I was in college. It's in Springfield, Missouri. There was this guy that was telling me this story. He was, he was in this season where he was battling this crazy amount of depression. He was like, he was just so incredibly depressed. Maybe some of you guys can relate to this. He didn't know what to do. Well, he was at a bookstore, and he saw a man that he described as being dressed uniquely, and he walked over to this, to this guy. He started a conversation with him. He started talking to him, and this guy was like, I'm an angel. I don't know, he probably had the same reaction. Some of you guys are thinking, like, yeah, okay, you're an angel. Show me your wings, buddy. Like, you know, like, like what? Like, prove it. Prove to me that you're an angel. And this guy said to him, he's like, well, I mean, I've seen this, and I know this about your life. And he started saying all these things that only an angel could know. <laughs> started talking about things that happened way in his past and things that he was dealing with then. It was, it was crazy. And he said that as he continued to talk to this guy, he was strengthened spiritually and, and mentally. You know, we talked about how angels strengthen you. And, and he asked the angel, can I see you again? The angel said, yeah. And he's like, okay, when? When, when am I going to see you again? And the angel said, don't worry about that. Two weeks later, the angel appeared to him again. And, and he had a conversation with him. And he said that his depression has been gone ever since. Now, just like this verse says, there might be someone that you meet on a Wednesday night. There might be someone you meet on a Sunday. Maybe someone that you see at church camp. And it says that they might be an angel. Now, I know some of you guys are like, what? This is so ridiculous. But the Bible is clear about that. And honestly, I think that's so stinking cool. I think that's so cool. I'm going to share with you guys a story. If you guys will stand up. This is where I got the title of the message from. How many of you guys have ever heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah, I love their names. If they weren't so weird, I'd probably name my kids that. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the setting of this story is there's this, there's this evil king called King Nebuchadnezzar. And he creates this golden statue. And he orders everyone, he said, listen, everyone has to go down and, and bow down to this idol and worship it. And if they don't, we're going to kill them. So that's the setting. In verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar. Your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaming furnace and anything else you might cook up, O king. But even if he doesn't, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Nebuchadnezzar, his face purple with anger, cut off Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace fired up seven times hotter than usual. He ordered some strong men from the army to tie them up, hands and feet, and throw them into the roaring furnace. Next slide, it continues. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, bound hand and foot, fully dressed from head to toe, were pitched into the roaring fire. 
because the king was in such a hurry and the furnace was so hot, flames from the furnace killed the men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to it. While fire raged around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, suddenly King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm and said, didn't we throw three men bound hand and foot into the fire? That's right, O king, they said. But look, I see four men walking around freely in the fire, completely unharmed. And the fourth man looked like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar went to the door of the roaring furnace and called in, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the high God, come out here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out of the fire. All the important people, the government leaders, and the king's counselors gathered around to examine them and discover that the fire hadn't so, as, so much as touched the three men. Not a hair singed, not a scorch mark on their clothes, not even the smell of fire on them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They ignored the king's orders and laid their bodies on the line rather than serve or worship any god but their own. Therefore, I issue this decree. Anyone anywhere of any race, color, or creed who says anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be ripped to pieces from limb to limb and their houses torn down. There has never been a god who can pull off a rescue like this. Listen, I don't know what you guys need from God, but I know that he can provide it. He knows your situation. He knows exactly what you're going through. And you don't need to pray that God will send you an angel, but he might. He might send your friend. He might send a life group. He might send a Bible study. He might speak to you with his own voice. He might speak to you through the Bible. Or he might send an angel to comfort you, to strengthen you, to protect you, to direct you, to encourage you. Listen, the point is, the supernatural world is very real. We live in a supernatural world. And what the Bible says about heaven and hell, angels and demons, it's all real. We live in a supernatural world. So if you guys would bow your head and close your eyes, I'm going to pray really quick and we're going to go back into a time of worship. Got me out here looking blind. Got me with the tears and the th